I've always been intrigued by the concept of modularity in things. For years, it's one of the things that's made car culture so great. It's even a big part of the firearms industry, both of which I'm very passionate about. But what about phones? Typically, the features you get with your phone are the only ones it'll ever have after LG's failed attempt. Sorry, LG. And Motorola's semi-successful foray into the niche market of modularity. Andy Rubin, the former co-founder of Android, you know, the world's most popular mobile phone operating system ever. Ever heard of it? He set out with the mission of launching a phone with all the essentials that could be added upon for the ultimate experience. While the phone sales didn't do great, mostly being plagued by poor sales due to a high launch price and subpar cameras, but how did it do with modularity? And should you even still care about this phone? And how well did it age over the last two years? Well, that's what we're here to find out in my potentially new video series. I'm Dave Otekdov, and welcome to the Essential PH1 LTR Long-Term Review. The Essential phone, when it launched, was the first phone with a notch display. Not counting the LG V10, which technically did indeed have a notch, but that's a tale for another time, perhaps. At first, it was polarizing to have a cutout for the camera interrupt the display. However, it was a sign of things to come, a market trend still holding steady today. Anywho, this display measures in at 5.7 inches with a resolution of 2560 by 1312, giving it a crazy pixel density of 504 pixels per inch, and a stretched aspect ratio of 18.5 to 9. Unfortunately, when we all heard rumors of this phone, I think I speak for everyone when I say we were hoping for an OLED panel up front. But instead, what we got was an LCD panel resulting in an 85% screen to body ratio. Which might have been higher had it been an OLED. It's a decent looking screen. It's a bit on the dim side, only reaching a maximum sustained brightness of 550 nits. Though this doesn't take away from the amazing colors, sharp looking images, and decent viewing angles. It's a pretty decent B plus display. Where this phone really shines, quite literally, is in its build quality. While most phones stick with aluminum or stainless steel frame with glass on the front and back, the mad lads at Essential saw fit to equip this tank of a phone with grill glass 5 up front, a ceramic panel around back, sandwiched on top of a titanium frame. A far more premium metal than either of the aforementioned more common frame materials. And man does it feel like a solid phone. It affords you the kind of confidence an old Nokia 3310 might have a few decades ago. God, that hurt to say. And aside from now realizing how old I am, it's still a good feeling solid device even after two years of on and off use. On the right side of the phone is the power button, volume buttons, and nothing else. On the bottom is the speaker grill, USB-C port, microphone, and a SIM card tray. Up top is another microphone, and unfortunately, no headphone jack. I guess that along with any kind of official IP rating wasn't so essential to Andy and the boys. To be blunt, this is one of my favorite feeling phones ever. It inspires the kind of confidence that if you were to accidentally drop it, it would break the ground. In this category, it gets an A+, aside from the scuffs it's gotten on the color treatment on the titanium frame. If we are to talk about audio, we must once again address the slight misstep of not including a headphone jack. While it wasn't a huge deal to me to not have the beloved and rare 3.5mm headphone jack aboard this phone, they more than made up for it with the high bitrate from the included USB-C to 3.5mm adapter in the box. To understand what I mean, we have to compare this to the built-in DAC of the LG phones of recent years. Less attention has been paid to wired audio as of late in the smartphone market, with LG being the last of major flagships to include a headphone jack in flagship devices. Their 32-bit quad DAC is the very best you can find in any phone, with it being capable of driving some serious audiophile grade headphones. But the dongle included with the Essential phone isn't far off with its 24-bit capabilities. It's a strong contender even against LG's best. Performance is similar to LG's built-in solution, and the benefit of a dongle is in how easily it's replaced. The big downside to this phone in terms of audio quality is the single speaker, when even at the time of its release companies had switched to dual speaker configurations. Not only is the audio from the Essential phone nothing to brag about, but it's located in an easy to block position on the bottom of the phone. And though it gets plenty loud for casual use, it's one sore spot on an otherwise very interesting phone. The Essential phone is a culmination of everything done right in terms of performance with Snapdragon 835 paired with 4GB of RAM and stock Android on top. Even two years later, 
about to be three, the Essential Phone is still a viable option, able to run any apps or games you can throw at it with very little issue. This likely has a lot to do with the bloat-free nature of its software. You can have this phone in either 64GB or 128GB of non-expandable storage, which for most people is plenty enough. 2017 was a year of heavy software skins, and it sometimes made the 835 processor look bad. I'm happy to say even now the Essential Phone still holds up to modern apps, games, and tasks. Very rarely does a phone keep at speed for many years after release. However, you can tell this device was a labor of love since Essential has essentially gone under. Sorry. Back when the PH1 was first released, it had a respectable 30-40 mAh battery. A size most devices were hovering around, not like the behemoth 4000 plus mAh batteries of today. But for such a compact phone, it got the job done. Mostly. With the screen brightness at 50%, I was able to finish a day with around 20% charge remaining with about 6 hours of screen on time. Perfectly serviceable when you take the included 27 watt charger into account, which is capable of charging the phone from 0 to 100% in around an hour and 20 minutes. What this phone doesn't have is wireless charging. Not a big deal for me since I rarely ever use it, however it would have been nice addition to have. Since more features is never a bad thing, the ceramic back would totally have allowed for this. Anyway, the battery is still strong two years later, netting me around the same numbers as before. However, I did not use this phone as my main device for the entirety of the two year period, so take that with a grain of salt. As stated earlier, the Essential Phone is running a very clean stock version of Android, with only a small handful of pre-installed Essential apps being the camera and software update apps. Since its release, it's seen two major updates from Android Oreo to Android Pie and from Pie to Android 10, which I'm still upset that it doesn't have a dessert name. Come on Google, you couldn't figure out a dessert that started with the letter Q? Or did you just outgrow that naming scheme? As per usual, the essential phone being of the stock Android variety, animations are smooth and fluid, with very little lag, stutter, or frame drops to be noticed in day-to-day -day use. Android has become a very efficient operating system over the years, despite its highly customizable nature. It has no issue handling multitasking of several apps, gaming, or consuming content. At least not for me. Even two years later, it's a solid performer with no major crashes or anything else to report. Around back is the Essential Phone's primary biometric authentication method, the old reliable capacitive fingerprint scanner, which doubles as a trackpad of sorts, allowing you to pull down the notification shade. It's a shame this wasn't implemented on more phones with physical scanners while they still had them. It's fast, it's reliable, and secure even two years later, it doesn't miss a beat. It just wouldn't be a complete review if we didn't discuss the elephant in the room. The cameras. I'm not going to say they're terrible, but I won't be too kind to them either. They're still not great. With the assistance of Google's Gcam, they do manage to eke out some decent results, but I wouldn't trust it for treasured memories. And though the Essentials phone has seen a number of camera improvements via software updates, I wouldn't say it was enough to make them comparable to the iPhones and the Pixels of the world. And speaking of those cameras, they're comprised of two 13 megapixel sensors. The first being a standard RGB sensor with an aperture of f1.9 with phase detection autofocus. And the second also with an aperture of f1.9. The difference being that it is of a black and white variety, a niche market for photography seeing as you can apply a black and white filter to photos after the fact in editing. I would have preferred an ultra wide angle here, if I'm being honest. The photos are perfectly serviceable, if not a little soft and lacking dynamic range, a tarnish on an otherwise amazing first attempt by Essential. Up front is the selfie shooter nestled in the smallish, oddly shaped notch. It's an 8 megapixel unit with an aperture of f2.2, shots from it are uh, just okay. It lacks a dynamic range of competitors even at release, and more often than not shots are noisy or soft, especially under dimmer lighting. The front camera is capable of 1080p 30fps, while the rear can shoot up to 4K 30 and 120fps at 720p. Though I wouldn't depend on these cameras to shoot the next Marvel movie. One of the few things that sets the Essential apart, aside from being only the second phone ever with a notch, is the modularity. But instead of going the Motorola route where the modular add-ons are a clip-on attachment that covers the whole back of the phone, or the LG route where you load in a modular attachment like a magazine into a gun, the Central elected to use two pins on the upper right hand corner of the back of the phone, which oddly only transfer power and not data as well. That's handled wirelessly. While there aren't a great many modular attachments for the PH1, 
other than what Essential at one point called the world's smallest 360 degree camera and the HD audio adapter, which is just Essential's way of selling you an add-on headphone jack for lulz. All jokes aside, while I haven't tried the audio adapter with its hefty $150 price tag, I do have the 360 degree camera, and I'll be posting some video samples from said camera after this review goes live. I wouldn't say it's a life-changing add-on, but for its listed price of $49 and its 2K and 4K 360-degree photos and videos, one of the cheapest 360-degree cameras out there, assuming you already have the phone, of course. The footage from it is pretty good, too. It's not iPhone-level video capture, but I don't think it was ever meant to be. The modularity is what makes this phone so appealing in the first place. It's just a shame it didn't gain more popularity because I truly believe Essential did it right. The Essential phone was plagued with some very silly problems from launch, from unfinished camera software to a somewhat outrageous starting price and lack of support from carriers. Despite all that, several price drops later made it a very compelling phone, and at the time of its release, it really was a unique device, which I wish had completely succeeded. For all of its shortcomings, the camera, the LCD display, the lack of water resistance, the lack of a headphone jack, no micro SD card support, now this is sounding like a roast. I promise it's not. Despite all of that, the essential phone for whatever reason has ended up in my pocket alongside whatever the newest iPhone at the time is more often than not. Even two years later, Andy Rubin and company's first attempt at a phone remains a guilty pleasure of mine. Had the price been right, and perhaps with some better optics, this phone could have been a runaway success. But as it stands, it's just another Android phone in a sea of heavy hitters lost to the sands of time. Thanks for watching. Please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss my upcoming iPhone 11 Pro Max review. I'm Dave with TechDev, and I'll see you in the next video.